of symposia that will happen and will run until November 9 to uh, celebrate uh, together with the program of performances and a show that we're going to see later after the finish of the symposium, uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of foundation of the Grand Juvenile from the uh, spirit of Rome. Um, so just uh, I would like to uh, to say a few words about the reason of this symposium. Uh, the symposium is dedicated to the groundbreakers. The groundbreakers who made very turning point shows in the last decades, and we have invited some of them to talk about their own shows. Because uh, the Biennale became a very important uh, event in the last decades, and one of the, uh, the most important uh, for to present art and especially to present art in a uh, in connection with uh, very articulated uh, contemporary social economic or political scene. And uh, there are some of these shows, they are not only by energy, even big shows, but there are some of these shows we are able to, uh, to change the status of art or the debate of art. And these shows are made by this groundbreaker. Uh, groundbreakers uh, curator. And so it seems very interesting for us to to connect this with the celebration of one Biennale that is one of the most important Biennale in the world and for sure the most important in Asia. Uh, I would like here to present uh, Mr. Sang Yoo Kim that is uh, one of the um, one of the, the Associate curator working on the project for celebrating the, uh, the 20th anniversary of the Foundation of Biennale, the, uh, the Sweet View since 1980. This is the title, as you can see. And, uh, and uh, Mr. San Yukim was one of the key figures of the civil uprising in the 1980s, so I'm very, I'm very honored to work with him on this uh, series of lectures. And Mr. Nam Sin Kim, professor of aesthetic. Please, if you want to turn up. Yeah, to Mr. Samuel Kim, if you want to stand up, please. And uh, uh, now we will have a short uh, in introduction uh, made by uh, Dr. Yongbo Lee, the president of the Guangzhou Biennale. Who is given the keynote speech, uh, speech the speaker in this uh, in this symposium? So uh, I invite him to join me to arrive here to the, uh, to the microphone to deliver his uh, welcome speech. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Lee.
같은 세계 인의분들 세계 인의것은또 이것이 1970년 5월에 일어난 하나의 사건이 아니고 어, 우리 삶의 가치이자 전 세계 인의 한번 쉐어할 수 있는 그런 가치가 아니겠냐 하는 의견들을 갖게 되었습니다. 그래서 저희 20주년 프로젝트는 제 10회 비엔달리아만 별도로 특별하게 따로 떼어서 저희가 편집한 형식입니다. 따라서 에, 오늘 이 렉처 시리즈는 그 이미 첫 강의는 에, 지난 어, 3월 달에 이파대학교 대학, 홍대학교 어, 강당에서 저희가 장부가지 어, 입니다 강의를 했었습니다. 오늘 두 번째로 이제 그네분 이름을 전에 참석하셔서 발표하는 시간이 되겠습니다. 에, 강연 시리즈를 기록해서 여러분들이 강의 끝나고 나시면은 이 프로그램 쪽과 함께 시리즈관에서 어, 전시회가 오픈이 있고 또그 뒤에 저녁 9시부터는 예, 근원로 일대를 비롯한 방우신의 경에서 복공원 생산과 벌어지게 됩니다. 그래서 20주년 특별 프로젝트는 단순하게 강연회가 아니고 이 강연회는 여러 가지 초점이 맞춰져 있습니다만은 가령 어, 이 광주 정신이 뭐냐 하는 문제를 전문가와 전문가라는 학자를 뜻하겠습니다. 또, 또 시민사회와 또 문화예술계와 다양한 그, 그 도움주에서 참가하는 나무 대구를 이미 다 끝냈습니다. 참여에 걸쳐서 했고 또 이것이 이제 저희 그 20년 특가진사의 종류와 함께 에, 나름대로 광주전신에는 이 사단운동을 좀 생각하고 해서 마니페스토 작업도 이제 준비하고 있습니다. 이 이런 그 광주전신에 관한 새로운 그 연구가 꼭 비행하게 해야 될 일이냐라고 하는 질문이 있을 수 있습니다만 에, 저희 그 시민사회와 함께하고 저희 인계나 시민들의 사랑을 받는 이벤트라는 확신을 가지면서 어, 저희가 이 시민사회에 봉사할 수 있는 또 다른 참여의 일환으로 광주정신을 어떻게 저희가 재조명하고 구현할 것이냐 하는 것 이것을 저희가 자임하고 나선 것입니다. 이러한 그 저희 뜻이 시민사회와 전문가들 여러분에게 함께 전달되어서 접촉했다는 생각을 갖고 있습니다. 에, 오늘 이 것은 그 전시 복문서 함께 강행성 두 번째로서 어, 그런 브레이크 자만은 예, 주제를 갖고 접근을 하게 되었습니다. 많이 즐겨 주시기 바라겠습니다. 고맙습니다. 
Good morning, Okui. And uh, now we will be talking about uh, the groundbreakers, which is the theme of uh, this meeting, actually. Uh, the first question is, the Guangzhou Biennale is celebrating its 20th anniversary. And it was launched at the same time as the unveiling of the Johannesburg Biennale, which you directed, and has grown into one of the significant Biennale today that is known for its uniqueness. What are your thoughts on the 20th anniversary of the Guangzhou Biennale? What would you like to make on this? Well, you know, first, let me say, uh, Yongwu, uh, thank you so much you know, for the invitation to participate in the celebration uh, of the 20th anniversary of the Guangzhou Biennale. I think it's a measure of the stature of Guangzhou Biennale that one things that is already been around for more than 20 years. Right. And that, that means that from the very beginning when the Biennale was established, it also marked the significance of the shift, if you will, of the entire topography of the field of contemporary art and the way that exhibitions are constituted as spaces, as you said, mm. uh, of cultural action, and um, just more than just simply being an exhibition. And I think also what I want to you know, address in this particular question is the relationship that you try to draw between Johannesburg and Guangzhou. And I think that these two particular exhibitions really represent a very unique you know, turning point, not only in the, in the context of the expansion of the entire field of contemporary art, mm -hmm. uh, but also the shift you know, into other terrains of, of practice in the world. With Guangzhou, in the case of Guangzhou, Asia, in the case of Johannesburg, Africa. So in a sense, these are the two exhibitions that one can say, the two biennials that one can say properly anticipated the global, or in fact inaugurated the global. Mm -hmm. That is this transversal transformation of the, of, 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 the, of the field of you know, contemporary art exhibitions which Johannesburg and Kwanju uh, participated in is something that we have to keep in mind in terms of the historical importance of this shift. The second point I want to underscore in the intersection between Johannesburg and Kwanju in 1995 is that both exhibitions were established, you know, precisely at a very important historical turning point in each of the countries where they were, right. you, know, and, you know, done. In the case of Kwangju, they, you know, they returned to democracy in South Korea, the, the use of the, you know, the, you know, um, the, the role that Kwangju played in the Minjun, you know, movement during this, during this period, the democratic movement. And in the case of South Africa, right. the first democratic elections in 1994, the election of Nelson Mandela at the end of apartheid. Mm -hmm. They saw the historical necessity of these two particular exhibitions, in my view, is something that is really understudied right. in our field. And that makes it all the more important mm -hmm. that Country Biennale in the 20th anniversary has not only grown, but has become even more indispensable in the discussion about you know, contemporary art and the global sphere. So uh, these are my thoughts, and it's an enormous privilege to be associated with the Quantu Biennale. Uh, I've had the privilege of visiting the Biennale in the, you know, earlier, but also the enormous honor of being invited to serve as the artistic director of the, of the, of the, 2008. And, of the 2008 uh, Biennale. Uh, so, in, in, in a sense, one of, one of the things I want to return to, young woman, and I think it's necessary, and please forgive me if I embarrass you, <laughs> um, you know, that it's, it's, so it's not so much also the, the uh, shall I say, the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of Quantum Biennale. Right. It is also your own anniversary, in a sense. So, because it takes singular individuals to be able to bring institutions, organizations, and events to the kind of global consciousness 
that makes those institutions resilient, strong, and progressive. And you have done exactly that as the founding director, artistic director of the Biennale, and now leading the institution in a very dynamic, um, exhilarating, and innovative way. So it is as well the role that you've played, not only in quantity Biennale, but the role you've played in placing you know, contemporary art in this broader global sphere. So I, I salute you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You just mentioned about your directorship, 2008 Kwangju Biennale, which we actually share the spirit of the mutual historicity between Jonas Berg and Kwangju. And then you also at that time mentioned about uh, the European Revolution, the 40th anniversary of the European Revolution, 1968. Do you remember that? Of course I do. Well, it was something that put me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because, you know, in, in many ways, the question is that, you know, it, it, uh, what I was trying, the point I was trying to make and, the, you know, and the question I was trying to raise by drawing, you know, you know together these trends of historical ruptures mm -hmm. with May 68 seen as it's at the center of it, is to say that the theater of history does not only belong to the powerful. It does not only belong to the people who, you know, um, you know, control the tools of discursive power. Yeah. And so, and I think that in my view that May 68 had become overly mythologized. It's mythologized in such a way that it does not, that the people are actually quite careless when they you know, refer to May 68 as a turning point. And I think it's a, you know, you, you know the greater degree of historical modesty is necessary mm -hmm. in order to take account of the complexity of the historical shifts that are, you know, taking place across the world. I do not necessarily share the opinion that May 68 changed very much. Right. It did not certainly, you know, it, 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 maybe in Europe, maybe in pockets, of, um, of, of ideas in Europe, but when you think of the entire complex of world historical formation, right. I think is, it seems to me a little bit um, exaggerate, an exaggeration to blanketly say Nace, it's changed everything because look at what happened in Mexico, look at what happened in, 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 in Japan or the United States. Well, I mean, I think, of course, you know, you have these conflagrations that take place all across the world. Right. The question we have to ask, why did it take so long mm. for the artistic scene or for the art world, you know, to be able to absorb the lessons of the ruptures that Nancy had produced? Mm -hmm. Why wasn't the art world more open, more inclusive, more radical, more... Um, you know, disobedient of the figures of authority, uh, as <laughs> Benjamin Buchler will, 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 will call them. Why wasn't the art world in this way? It took the opening of these so-called peripheral spaces to bring an awareness, if you will, to the necessity that there needs to be a greater global dialogue and a greater sense of historical modesty in terms of how we think about ruptures that occur across the world. And Kwang Ju Biennale in 2008, so for me, I want to look at the different processions, and that's why I think to go back to Kwang Ju Biennale, both in 2008 and 1995, and Johannesburg, 95, 97, and all you know, different you know, Biennales that occur in different parts of the world. Right. They emerge at particular historical junctures, and that's, those are the things we have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, actually, today's theme, as we know, is the ground breakers. This refers to curators, actually, exhibition makers, who brought about significant changes at visual culture by uh, acting and interpreting contemporary art and its discourses to audiences, actually. They created something in the frame of the exhibition that others were hesitate to hold or did not hold. You brought various geopolitical minorities who were regarded as being at the margin of contemporary art 
into the center of the discourse. In fact, you are still doing so. And leading examples are the 1995 Johannesburg we just talked about, and 2002 Kassel Documenta, and 2000 Guangzhou Biennial at large. What meaning do you assign to these exhibitions briefly? Well, let me first say that you know, I organized in 97 Johannesburg Biennale. So it was just the, the second edition. And, but but to, to, to return back to, um, you know, to, to, the, to the point you, you just made, uh, I want to say very briefly, though, that um, I'm almost embarrassed to be included mm. in the group of groundbreakers. And uh, to the extent that I accept to participate in this discussion about groundbreakers, it has to do with my own relationship to, you know, not only Kwame Jun Biennale, but, the, but to the discourse of contemporary art, right. which you so, you know, fantastically um, elaborated. I think, you know, my own particular work um, is really to act within the field of global contemporary art. And to do so, one should not just simply say it, one has to inhabit it. One has to, you know, live it as, uh, as an active, you know, part of one's own intellectual life, mm. one's own curatorial, um, you know, commitment. I am committed to the expansive, uh, to the idea that contemporary art is off-centered, it is broad, it is not, you know, only something that takes place in the previous capitals of, of economic and political power. It is much more dispersed. You know, the Igbos, um, you know, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, you know the, the, the group where I come from in Nigeria, the Igbos have a say. They will say that you cannot watch a masquerade from one vantage point. Right. Because the masquerade is a performative, you know, action. It moves around. It's very dynamic. And in order to really absorb and experience that dynamism, you have to move with the masquerade. So similarly, in the field of contemporary art, if I do not go to Asia, if I do not go to Africa, if I do not go to South America, if I do not go to the Middle East, if I do not in from these regions, if I do not commit myself to the kind of intellectual dialogue and artistic exchange right. that is necessary to create a dynamic exhibition, then I am not really participating right. in my field. So this is precisely the reason why uh, I make it part of my own intellectual commitment, my own curatorial curiosity to be able to work with artists from across the world. And what that has given me back is an enormous, you know, new knowledge that each time I work on exhibitions, it is an opportunity to learn something. But it's an opportunity also to create a ground, as it were, for, for disputes. Not only, you know, we don't necessarily have to agree on everything, but it's a ground of dispute, a ground of discourse, a ground of dialogue, and a ground uh, you know, a terrain of, of possibility. So that is the way I work. And, uh, and, uh, and as you rightly point out, you know, I don't think this would change that much in Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to say that the, the leopard does not shed its spots, and neither does the tiger lose its, its stripes. <laughs> you know? right. so, so I'm going to be, continue to be committed you know, to this really you know, broader way of thinking about making uh, biennials and exhibitions. Well, if I recall the memory of the Johannesburg Biennale, actually, I saw the, the Biennale itself, and I found it was very socio-political, radical, rough, beautiful, and challenging, as it was supposed to be, actually. And I did the same first edition of the Guangzhou Biennale. Unfortunately, the Johannesburg Biennale is no longer being held. This is extremely regretful. Is there any chance uh, uh, of it being held again, or I believe a BNR is, is more than a simple exhibition, and it's a cultural movement. Do you agree? 
Well, I think that one of the things I really actually, you know, en you know um, enjoy about what you've just said is the way you've tried to actually invent a new term for being athletes as a cultural movement. Because it takes it beyond the realm of just the exhibition. You know, that it's a, it's a, it's, it's a place of contradiction, but it's a place of convergence as well as a space of conflagration. Exactly. So, and this is, for me, something that is really very important. That yes, when we go to Quantum Biennale, or we go to Johannesburg, or we go to Sao Paulo, or we go to, to Venice, you know, any number, or to, to, to Whitney Biennial, or to Manifesta, we are, in a sense, you know, really exposing the fact right. that modern museums, right. Biennales have very serious artistic, cultural, and political stakes in them. Look at what happened, in, you know, in, with Manifesta in Nicosia, right. and so look at what happened in Manifesta, right? What is happening in Manifesta? right now in St. Petersburg, right. and so on. So how do we leave this sense of, you know, of rupture, this sense of temporal, historical, um, um, you know, in, incompleteness? And that is, you know, through this idea of a cultural movement that you've mentioned, I think this is really quite, a, you know, a radical mm. um, you know, proposition you know, because it means that the Biennale is not just merely institutionalized. Mm -hmm. It means that it's an active actor within this, you know, constellation of forces, you know, geopolitical for forces, economic forces, technological forces, cultural forces, political forces, social questions, and this is a laboratory for artists to come together to help us think the present in imaginative ways. And the, 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 the kind of territory that the Biennale presents uh, is actually quite unique. It is something that museums are unable to present. And I think this, this notion is very important. So Johannes spoke though, I don't know if it's really essential for the Biennale to be resurrected. Right. I mean, it was and it was a, it was a, of its moment, mm. and unfortunately, the political forces uh, sort of arrayed against the Biennale were too strong, too strong in the sense that South Africa itself was a country at that particular time that was really undergoing transition, that was undergoing reconciliation. I mean, the wounds of apartheid were deep, right. really, really deep. And the psychic wounds, the physical wounds, the spatial wounds could not make it possible yeah. to, to so quickly, you know, eradicate the kind of you know, tension and division that separated different classes and, of course, different races in the country. Mm -hmm. So Johannesburg was, you know, was an utopian, you know, project. It was a product of its time. And, and I think, you know, it, even though that it took place only twice, its memory looms, it's, you know, very, very large. Mm -hmm. And I think, though, that Johannesburg, because of Johannesburg Biennale, South African artists, a uh, much better place around the world today. So the, I think it did its job mm. in an incredible way. So. <laughs> okay, uh, you are the director of the next Venice Biennale, and, and will you, would you maintain the overall direction or political stance that you reflect in the previous exhibition? Next year's Venice Biennale is already showing some signs of the uh, active appearance of the geographical margins or minorities? Well, I mean, I don't know if we can really speak in these terms in, in the context of the, of the, of the, of the next Venice Biennale, you know, 
um, minorities, margins. I, I, I do not, I do not believe in margins anymore. Mm. In this sense, I think that what makes you know the global context in which we live is that the previous centers are now the margins. Let me give you an example. I think is and you know what we should pay attention to is this incredible idea of the Asian century. You know, we've lived, we've lived the American century, which is the 20th century. We lived the long 19th century, which was the century of imperialism and colonialism, and that was Europe dominating the world. And now we're a completely different moment. And I think it's a moment that is not only just, if, even if we call it the Asian century, it's a moment in which we cannot neglect Africa mm -hmm. uh, as a force for um, growth and, 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 and transformation. Uh, we cannot neglect what's happening in the Middle East. It's, it's just impossible. We cannot neglect South Asia. So we are in a completely different you know, historical moment. Right. When Alibaba you know, goes, you know, in, it becomes a public company and is listed in the New York Stock Exchange, it would be the largest IPO in history. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10 years ago, nobody could imagine that the most, the, the, you know, the most valuable technology, internet company in the world would be from China. Nobody would believe that Samsung Electronic will basically demolish and knock off the Japanese companies from the global stage. So we can't predict, you know, that the, 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 the velocity of historical change mm. is much quicker today. Right. So we, can't, we cannot speak in the, in, the, in the old terms of centers and margins. I think, you know, those are obsolete terms. So for Venice though, we have a much more different you know, countries, because, you know, Venice is an archipelago, you know. So how does one think the world from this archipelago as it were? How does one think the world from this particular vantage point? And that is what I'm trying to sort of imagine what the exhibition will look like, you know, to think about it, you know, the, the question of the long durée of the exhibition. It will last for seven months to talk, to think about you know, the responsibility and the commitment of art and artists at all times. What does that mean? That means that we have to take some chances. That means that it could possibly be a Biennale of contradictions. We are beautiful objects, you know, uh, and, and works and images are next to very, you know, terrifying, ugly, or, or whatever, or things that are completely abstract. But we have to leave that realism, that abstraction, and that indeterminacy simultaneously. And I think that is a question I'm trying to, slow to, uh, to to deal with in terms of how the exhibition is constituted. It's very large, as you right. very well know. And, and um, so we'll see, it's, it's still a work in progress. Well, sorry for my repetitive questions of the Venice period, but just one last. No, 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 it's, it's good, it's good. Yeah, it's the, Venice has a kind of an extremely peculiar Biennale structure, as we know. Notwithstanding, it seems like it is steadily becoming a kind of art olympiad, as we know. And the Venice government and Venice Foundation, the Biennale Foundation, don't seem to be regard this negatively. But a careful approach needs to be taken, actually. I ask the opinions of all panelists here today, actually, who are groundbreakers. Please state your opinions to the extent that you feel comfortable with. About Venice? Yeah, about the Venice. Well, I mean, I think this, one thing I will say, though, is that I do believe that Venice Biennale is a very unique, you know, model. It was a model, as you very well remember, many other Biennales try to adopt. But the notion of the National Pavilion the notion of all of these subsidiary events can only really happen in Venice. 
in the way in which it was articulated in the beginning of 1895. I tend to believe that the anachronism of Venice Biennale is in fact its particular uniqueness and strength. This idea... In a way, yes. Yeah, in a way. Because if you think about it, the Biennale now has grown from, say, 25, 29 um, pavilions to about 90. And many of the pavilions that we see in Venice today were countries that did not exist 25 years ago. So in a sense, you know, without intending to, Venice has become a kind of social mirror. Mm. It's been a geopolitical mirror of the very changes that we've all lived throughout. And what it does say, though, is the very fragility of the construct of the nation state. I will tell you something. You know, you look at the, you know, in the, in the Giardini itself, it is very much expanded if you, so that you can really follow the history of, of our modern era just by going to Venice Biennale. Right. The, the, the Russian pavilion started life in 1909 as Russian pavilion. And by 1919, it was Soviet pavilion right. until very recently when it reverted back to Russia. The Czechoslovakia pavilion started life as Czechoslovakia. And in the mid 90s, it became Czech and Slovakia. So these two split countries will alternate. The ex Yugoslavia pavilion is now a Serbian pavilion. Right. I mean, so there are so many, you know, changes that have even occurred within the Jardini itself mm. that we need to be attentive to. We need to, you know, to respond to. Even the Korean Pavilion, which was the last building that was built in the Jardini, the yeah, South Korean as well. With the South Korean Pavilion, really, you know, in many ways, you know, leaves clearly exposed the fact that the North and the South are still two different entities. So that geopolitical tier is very much visible mm. in the Jardini. So that's why I want to say that it's not so much an art Olympiad in that sense, mm -hmm. but really um, a space where the geopolitical changes we have lived in the you know for you know throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century are still very very visible. So the, the Giardini represents for me like. A, a large body with multiple scars carved into it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an interesting question, you know, to, to, to keep in mind. Right. And therefore, um, the ever proliferation of the national pavilions, you know, is, is a worry, yes, but I say what makes Venice great is that it compels you to make choices. You have to make clear choices. It's not possible to see everything. Mm. So you have to really decide. And that decision itself is the strength of the PNR. Right. Well, the, the simple explanation of curating or, or curation is exhibition programming and or planning. The, from the perspective of the curators, however, it is to create an arena for encounters with readers and for cultural action that uh, produces aesthetic doctrines. Curators also need a space to take an action, and that is what exhibition planning is about. So what are you, your thoughts? We briefly actually talked about this in New York when you gave a talk and mentioned that in Asia society in May this year. Yes. Right. Well, I mean, I think in, 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 in my case, and I can only speak for myself, the exhibition is a space in which to act. Um, and, and the subjectivity of a curator, you know, for me is just as important as the authority and the subjectivity of the arts work and the artists. Right? 
So these are the things that I think that need to be mobilized. I, um, and I think that um, this, this particular, you know, the, my, you know, critical agenda is to use the exhibition space as an active territory mm. for the constitution of this cultural action. Mm. And I know that it's very, you know, easy for some people to, uh, so to speak, uh, you know, pull away from, from this. But, you know, it's, it's an enormous responsibility to, to take over a space like Documenta, you know, and, and then use it to reaffirm, you know, the uh, close networks of authority rather than to use it to expand it and to break it up and so on. So, and I think that each time we act in a particular direction through our work, we are implementing what I would consider to be the intellectual responsibility of the curator to be able to create a space, that space of encounter. Like I said, it's a space of encounter, as you, you say, it's a cultural movement, you know, in terms of Biennale's, where you have constellation of forms, you have, you have a parliament of, of, of positions, and you have um, a, a, a space of beautiful conflagration. How do you, because each large exhibition is really, you know, a space of contradictions. Because how do you make sense of all these contradictory things living next to each other? And then producing meaning, you know, ultimately. And, and I think that is, that is what the work of the curator is about, is to really to be able to engender through that, the specificity of one's own curatorial um, position, um, that moment, you know, which enables, like I said, you know, the authority of the artwork, the subjectivity of the artist, and the position of the curator to coalesce, to produce something that really ultimately mm. is meaningful to the audience. Right. It's not in a narcissistic thing, that it is in a sense to bring all these different um, you know, situations and positions in order to speak to the vitality of artwork, to the vitality of the public space mm -hmm. where that, where one can act. Right. And, I, and I think the, the audience also acts because, you know, the audience is hungry to know what is going on in, in, in the different spheres of, of, of artistic and cultural practice. And, and I think it's an enormous privilege for curators to be able to, you know, define this territory, but without constraining the boundaries of the exhibition. And I think that is it's a, it's a challenge, but it's an interesting and exciting challenge. Mm. Well, uh, you've done a number of Biennales already, including, uh, you know, you're doing Venice and you've done uh, Guangzhou and Documenta, you've done the Seville Biennale before and Johannesburg. And then is the Venice Biennale going to the last one as a Biennale curator or? <laughs> well, one is always tempted to say, you know, this is, this is it. But, you know, um, I'm, 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 I'm still a little bit... Um, in, in my prime, I'm not yet ready to retire. Um, I think I'm, you know, uh, yeah, having done all these biennales, there are about seven of them. I don't know, in the last, you know, 20 years, a little bit too many, <laughs> if you ask me. Um, but it's an enormous privilege that I've done them. I still remain open to kind of, uh, you know, conversations that one can have elsewhere. I mean, I really enjoy doing meeting points, which is a very tiny, small, um, you know, project uh, that's, you know, from in the Middle East, starting in Beirut, Amman, Jordan, mm. and then it went to Brussels, went to 
Berlin and to Athens. They were originally, the project was originally supposed to be in Beirut, Damascus, Amman, Cairo, um, Tunis, and then the Arab Spring happened. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it happened right in the midst of the pre right. preparation. So I think in the future, perhaps, I might be really much more interested in smaller, more intense, more, you know, durational projects that really can last an entire year. Right. I'll tell you something, and this is something that is really quite amazing. You know, in 1974, in the Venice Biennale, the 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 the, uh, the 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 artistic director or the organizers decided not to hold the Biennale. Instead, they committed themselves to a solidarity with Chile and spent the entire year using the entire city as a field of cultural action. That is so beautiful and powerful. I would like to figure out how we can return to these kind of models. You know. Um, how we can do smaller things, but over a longer period that involve more people, that involve not just simply artists, but also involve, you know, just about every person who is, has a capacity to contribute something, to really merge the producer and the receiver into one body. Right. But, you know, we, we, we have to see. Well, as you know, the, the most groundbreaking exhibitions are happening in the museum and Biennales. And, uh, you know, we say, uh, we're not, I'm not going to curate the Biennale anymore, something like that. But we're still yes. doing shows in the museum because the museum is very much, in a way, a uh, customary place. And I remember once we shared an idea that uh, there are uh, a lot of the museums around and that there are still the shortage of the Biennale, where the discourses are consumed, created, and experienced. So uh, what would be the comparison, in a way, between the museums and Biennales? Because we still give the ontological questions to the Biennale. Why there are so many Biennales? Why, there are, uh, why we, do we need so many Biennales? Something like that. And what are the Biennales doing? Do the Biennales and the uh, hosting city grow together? Or, is the uh, BNR still one of the liveliest cultural actions, something like that? Well, I mean, I think that it, one has to really dif differentiate and distinguish between the Biennales and, the, and, and museums. Uh, the Biennale, as you say, is a cultural movement, it's also an event. The museum is an institution, and the constitution of these two different forms uh, are, are you know, really defined by very specific historical, um, you know, um, uh, definition of, 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 of each of their mission. I think that the metabolism of the museum is like, is much more slower. The museum, you know, really takes a much longer time to inhabit its own time. Right. The museum is not reactive in the way in which a Biennale is. The museum is much more diagnostic, much more, you know, you know it's, it, it, it works with what I would call an effective mechanism of delay. And that, de that mechanism of delay enables it to really absorb this material and to really bring it to the, to the space of, 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 of its discourse, uh, in, in a way that really provides a completely different orientation. It is much more, uh, you know, so the, the, the scholarship in the museum is much more deliberate, the research aspect, the, the educational aspect, and of course, museums are in many ways territorialized. They are municipal, they are local, as well as positioned within a uh, uh, you know, a much more ambiguous, imaginative, historical dimension. The analysis are not like that. Mm -hmm. The analysis really are, or tend to be more prognostic. Mm -hmm. The analysis tend to be much more, uh, shall I say, um, um, you know, full of anticipation, and and the analysis um, are also. Um, you know, 
models of, of disruption. And that model of disruption is something that really makes the PNL space uh, uh, um, incredibly uh, you know, dynamic. Not that business are not dynamic, but so I think that, that, that so is the way in which you know the ideas live within the body of these two different forms. They are not necessarily compatible, but I think what is very clear today is that the museum cannot really live without the Biennale. Mm. And but the Biennale can definitely exist without the museum. Right. You know, in the sense that if the, if the goal is to sort of to see the world uh, as interconnected and no longer as you know separated between the notion of you know different you know definitions of power, centers and margins, important and non-important, um, visible and invisible. All of those terms are no longer you know you know, the way we can look at the world. So the museums are now beginning to reshape their own, you know, self-definition, their own, you know, worldview, what the Germans would call Welterschwang, and so on. And so this position, this repositioning, you know, at some particular point, the Biennales have to contend with as well. I think that it's very clear that Biennales, you know, are now are coming under the pressure you know, to become more institutional. And, and I think that the danger sometimes for the Biennale is, is that they want to become museological. And I think it's something that we need to really find a way to, to, to discuss how not to become museological, mm. but to remain. To, you know, you know how they say in the Bible, to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to whomever what belongs to, you know, to, to whomever. So I think uh, the Biennale still have to, it's coming to a point where the analysts, you know, can no longer take for granted the fact that the mechanism of delay that the, that the museum has at its disposal is not necessarily the same mechanism that the Biennale should be using. All right, that's it. Okay, thank you very much for participating in this groundbreaking, let's say, uh, roundtable meeting and then looking forward to see another type of uh, groundbreaking exhibitions curated by a queer measure. Thank you. Thank you for participating in this. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, young woman. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now, I'm very honored to introduce to you uh, Mr. Casper Kearney is a leading figure of curator uh, worldwide, he's a groundbreaker, of course, and uh, he, he did a lot of work and many, organized many different shows. The first show he organized was a show by Klaas Holdenburg when he was 23, so he has a long career, we'll see. Uh, for this uh, event and this symposium, he is going to talk especially about Sculpt, uh, uh, sculpture projects in Münster that he founded in 1977. It's a, a, an event that happened each 10 years. This is very peculiar. I think there is no other uh, uh, exhibitions or biennials or kind of this kind of event happen in so long spread in so long time. I mean, each 10 years. And he's going to realize the third edition in 2017 after having already realized three editions. So, and uh, he deal perfectly with, in this project with the uh, issue that was very important, especially after the break of the end of the 60s, of the relation between art and public space. And it was one of the leading experiments on opening in that sense. It was re-articulated and uh, developed along almost 40 years. Just a second, uh, give me some indication. Mr. Greg, give me some indication to the translator for the uh, translator consequence of translation. So, just a few seconds. The discussion that will be after the break uh, uh, will ask something to, um, uh, to Mr. Koenig about the manifesto that he just created right now. It's still open 
until October. It was a very interesting experiment and we take uh, inspiration from the words formulated in the Skype conversation by Hopwe and Weser, talking about the complexity of a show like a manifesto, for example. But now, uh, please, Casper uh, Kenny, if you want to join us at the desk and presenting the Sculpture Project to Minister. Thank you very much. Sitting next to one room with this very special table <laughs> and seeing our great colleague, Aubrey and Victor, and decided to work on a car. <laughs> and because he is truly a groundbreaker, because he is such an elegant uh, person, extraordinary, elegant and important. I mean, you would be almost an ideal president of the United Nations and representing the world at its best. And the question, I was not going to run away, I just wanted to introduce myself to the interpreter. Because we are living in different cultural speeds, different cultural temperaments, different cultural. Uh, taste and sentimental kind of uh, captions, captures, whatever. So, this quite often happens that one speaks and one forgets that it is being translated. And then you don't know what kind of information exists. Sometimes you expect too much information. And then, especially when you make an exhibition, you have to think about the audience all the time. And we take interest of particular musicians and artists, but we also think about the audience to make sure that the intention of the artist can be met. It doesn't need a translation, but it needs a great sensibility and uh, a sense of craftsmanship, timing. Economic terms of what you put in, what you get out. And I was just thinking of the film, which you all probably know, which I personally like very much, Lost in Translation. And it's strange that even talking to people who are not quite well, some friends in Japan, nobody in Japan has a film. Because it's a cliche, the West has a which I think is very funny, and like all cliches have a certain sense of truth, and humor is always dealing with kind of cliches, what is true and what is a cliche. So I think you can measure the complexity of a culture of a particular nation by its comedians. So when they have good comedians, then quite often these comedians are being suppressed. So I'm sure you didn't have good comedians here in the 50s. And the Kangjubian Hada is particular because it's connected to a local political history. This is what we all have a more or more or less meaning about that an art show could have a political consequence. No, it doesn't. But it's interesting when a political process makes an exhibition like the Biennale possible. So therefore, this new Biennale is very competitive. And we will later on discuss the overall kind of problems of the Biennale and so on. So I will talk very briefly only about Münster. And the time of 10 years is quite clearly because when there was a need for the exhibition, we did not think that this should continue to be number two, number three, number four, number five. We all know this from Hollywood, even though there's a new film, The Planet of the Apes, number three, and I haven't seen it, but I have been reading quite a lot about the film, and good critics say number three is better than number one and number two. 
so they are learning it's an interesting subject and actually it deals with the internet it's a San Francisco kind of movie now what these 10 years is about is just that the first exhibition was very 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 much rejected it was an incredibly aggressive movie and after about five years it turned around and it became kind of a positive miss. And people were talking about something which I had not experienced. So it was a question of fashion, a question of political kind of interpretation. So things, especially cities, change all the time. Quite often we do not even notice where they change and how they change because we are part of the change. Also, the idea of globalization has changed the situation completely. So, 1977 is basically a time in a European context where West Germany, not East Germany, West Germany, not South Korea, North Korea, but it has some kind of connection, is opening or has opened up. So when Billy Brandt, the social democrat, who was an immigrant during the last time, and who used to be a mayor of West Berlin, became the chancellor. That was the end of the Cold War from the West German point of view. Because it was good. Business was good. They were selling pipes to Russia and got gas back. They were, in an American sense, perfect capitalists, a liberal system. So, 77 was after 68, the, the reference to the movement on 68, which was a kind of a, a dogmatic liberation by students, especially in Germany, which had the effect that it, this clearly became the end of the Nazi time. A generation had passed what happened during World War II. What happened? What happened? How did Auschwitz go happen? So this was on an academic level very much a question by people at 16, 15, 17, 18, 19. So the society changed quite a bit. Tourism, uh, economic kind of recovery, people were traveling, they were eating food, which was before only goods people would have in Italy or in Spain or in Yugoslavia. There were even lychee foods, you know, very kind of ironic. Oh wow, what is this? So it had a, quite an effect and there was a need to reverse 77 in Münster. And 77 in Münster happened because of a particular antagonistic relationship between the university and somebody who wanted to do good to give them a sculpture of Henry Moore, which is very humanist, which is very compromising. It looks like a card, but it's modern too. Henry Moore is a perfect artist for a post-war period. Everybody wants to be modern because modern art absolutely verboten, it was the press in the Nazi time of the war. So modern art was good, everything modern art. And the sculpture, only modern sculpture, very good. But the university said no. And that a controversy happened. And a young curator at the local museum of art and local history, Klaus Gustav, was also very supportive of being Brandt and the politics, even though he's a relatively uh, conservative person and then he likes art, likes food, he's very friendly, he's not, not at all dogmatic, but intelligent. So he was supporting a kind of socialist uh, position of open things up. And he said, what is necessary is to educate people in the town about the history of modern sculpture. 
beginning with Rondon and sort of ending in the 50s with Alexander Korob. And then there was a historical exhibition in the museum with Bracuzzi, with Batiste sculpture, with Rochenko and so on. And a second part, which was in the park, uh, Korob and so on. Now, the controversy with the university was so big and the exhibition which we then did, I was only responsible for the local, for the, the contemporary part, where I invited 12 artists to choose their own site and make a proposal and we would execute the work. Not all of the artists were invited where the works executed. So Walter de Maria did a very, very, uh, very prophetic, monumental kind of work and it was not done, at least not finished, because there was more money available to do something like that, a document. There were two or three other works which were also, could not be done because we didn't have the money, or we realized it couldn't be understood. So the, the founder of this exhibition is Klaus Busmann. I happen to, to know what he did. He knew about me, we never met before in person. Just his sister and my sister went to school together. It was kind of a neighborhood affair. And he said, do you want to participate? I lived in New York at the time. And I said, no, I didn't. I thought I would never go back to that town. That's where I'm from, I went to school. I left and I thought, this is it. It's like a goddamn bourgeois town. I'm glad to get out of So when he offered me to work with him, I was very happy because I had a reason to go back to visit my mother and to have a job rather than hanging around in town, which I left. So it's a kind of a biographical momentum which you objectify. So we should go and look at the beginning of the slide. And make it very brief. I'm just saying this is not an art in a sense uh, groundbreaking. It just happens to be necessary in this particular instance. So this sculpture by George Rickey was a compromise between the university, the mayor, and the museum. What Klaus Busmann proposed, they said, no, we don't like this. We don't like a pop sculpture of Klaus Oldenburg, or we don't like, no. But go back to the first picture. You see, George Rickey is a combination between David Smith, the American sculptor, and Carl. So it's a compromise. It's not an abstract sculpture. It looks like an abstract sculpture. It has very beautiful material, and it moves with the wind. Right? If there's strong wind, it goes fast. If there's rain, it turns over. So it's a naturalist. It's like it's very kind of uh, Asian. It's like rise in the wind. Right? So it's meditative, and it's very elegant and very beautiful. But it's more design and not necessarily art. But it's a, a compromise between these two. So I'm quite happy to see it now. At the time, I was totally against it. But that is something that different if you are 18 or if you are 70, right? So you get much more uh, generous and liberal in a good sense. So also what Oakley said is very important. The job we are doing is interesting because yes, you make mistakes. But if you're not stupid, you don't repeat mistakes. You don't, you always make new mistakes. So I'm just, um, we have just sent a little note to our colleagues. Where is it? Is that one for me? Right. We just sent two notes. One to our colleagues. We have just gone to the exhibition and had a phantom. Uh, tour of burning down the house. And this is to Jessica Morgan and her colleagues. You see there are three women working very hard, breaking the ground. I just bought it at the shop. And this is these wonderful radio women 
is sent to all computer readers. Right? So in 7070, big names, now big names, at that time people didn't know it. You know that voice was a big name in Germany then. And he didn't like the invitation in the beginning. He said, oh, we're working in public ground. This is like ecological pitch, you know. We have a museum, let's put it there. Why don't we do it somewhere in the ground, you know? And he actually went back into the museum. But he said, yes, I participate because I don't want all the Americans to take care of us, our business. And he said, yes, in America they have a different notion about what's public and what's private. It's all about money. In Germany at the time, this was a very important issue because public means the state. But the state had been very, very uh, involved in an injustice system. Students, church, there was every city in Germany was more or less Nazi. And everybody profited from the fact that there were somehow cooperating with the fascists. You see? So yeah, it was quite political. And what's interesting about 77, there were only male artists, and we didn't, I did not even notice that at the time. Because sculpture was a completely male dominated subject. And even the idea of sculpture doesn't exist anymore as it still existed then. And it was the idea of the history of sculpture. So at the time, when there was an architectural competition, and maybe a hundred architects would be invited. Maybe there was one or two other by women, but it basically were all men. So this central has changed completely. So there is a cardinal of change. And this is very important to focus on what that change means. And 10 years is a good decision at the time, because it's typical for the area. Munster is in Westphalia, it's an agricultural area, very old. And very kind of, it has a sort of aristocratic, right? laid back mentality. They, the city was completely destroyed in the war, was re rebuilt. And by now, people think it's a historical city, but in fact, it's only like a Disneyland historical. The, the patina of 60, 70 years looks like real old, but it's not. So, tendons is very typical for the Westphalian, their slow. And I'm from there too. We make jokes about this. Westphalians are, you, you can't get along with them unless you have eaten a whole set of salt. This is what they say. So that means, you know, you spend a long time together and eventually you can say, okay, I trust that person. You know, it's not talking much. It has a kind of sense of humor that nobody else understands unless they are from there, from me, from there. I see. We have a great sense of humor, but nobody knows this. Um, so, this was a compromise, and then I talked to you about the first 12 exhibitions, the first parties. We did it fast. Okay, this in a way is the mystery of the exhibition, and I'm going to be also responsible for the exhibition in 2017 which means the fifth time around, right? And I said, but then I would stop. And even if I would sit in a wheelchair, I just want to do it. Because I don't want the politicians to decide to do it every five years as I wanted to do it. I said, no, 10 years is the perfect time. 10 years means you're out of fashion. The economical uh, situation has changed completely, sociological change. So there's always change. And it's good to have something where you can find out where does change happen and what does change mean. So in some senses, I'm a super conservative because I think there's no need for me to each time look for different shoes when I have shoes which I like. So in some senses, I, I'm super conservative because I think it's good to leave things as they are there's a great quote of John Cage, which could also be a reactionary saying, don't try to change the world, you only make things worse. Right? Another quote, which he in fact made in Münster, 
and he is not only great friends of mushrooms, but also of birds. And he said in Winston, looking at the show, very interesting, birds have no interest in ornithology, right? which is interesting. So the, the basis of the show was a historical review of what sculpture means, and then the project took over. Okay. So Michael Asher was recommended for the exhibition by Dan Graham, whom I invited. What Dan Graham wanted to do was too complex, theoretically, <coughs> and then he said, okay, why don't you ask Michael Asher? He is interested more in architecture and urbanism, and he picked uh, one of those caravan cars which is being produced in this area, and parked it every week in another location. So, when 78 happened, 10 years later, he did the same thing, and people criticized very much, said, oh, this is a post-conceptual work, it looks like this, this, and that, not knowing that he was a real groundbreaker, he was an actual groundbreaker. But the fourth time around, this piece became very popular, because people could see how much the city changed, where the caravan was parked, there's a tree now, there's no parking anymore. Or the house was abolished and there is a parking lot, a big house, exactly there. So it became kind of a, 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 a test, which you could read from a sociological point of view. Okay. So this was an interesting situation. Klaus Oldenburg wanted to make a pool, a kind of a pop idea which means 18 balls. And we didn't have the money for 18 balls. We didn't have very little money at the time. And then he said, okay, I go to billion, which is European. In the American pool, you have 18 balls. And even if you are not very good, you always feel good because one will always go into the hole. It's very pragmatic, very psychological, very American. Bang, hole. So pool is much more complex, and he used the, the, the lake, the artificial lake, as a trajectory for the pool. This lake was made in 1928, 29, 30, at the time of the Wall Street crash, at the end of the Weimar Republic, and the beginning of a Nazi period which is very connected to the economy, to the history of the First World, World War, and kind of a brainwashing propaganda momentum. So the fact that the lake is now a very pleasant place for people to like, sail and like, and so on, had a reason which was not for the people. It was to employ people and give them food, no money, just food. So it has to do with the social history of the town. And when these pool balls were there, the students wanted to put them into the lake because for them are the reaction, bourgeois and so on. But they were not able to do it. And Bosman, in the meantime, became the director of the museum. And he was asked to call the police and make sure the students would go. And he didn't call the police. He said, no, I'm representing now. I'm not calling the police. Why should I call the police? So they tried very hard, hundreds of them, to put them into the lake, and they didn't. Now, this is the symbol of the town. And Klaus Oldenburg said, I'm considering to disown this. This is not a work of art anymore. This is the symbol. I said, yes, please do it. But we have to give the money back to the city. <laughs> so, humor is very essential. So, this is a work which remained also, like you call, of Donald Judd. Very simple. Two circles. One in light of the lake, and the other one horizontal, like the lake. And this piece was ignored for 25 years. 
because people were very aggressive about the exhibition, but this they saw it was part of the university of physics or of, you know, it has some plausibility. It's quite beautiful. And then in four times later, when sort of event was to the subject, there were two or three artists who wanted to transform this into a bar, into a sauna, and so on. I said, no, do something on your own. And since this is called a line of, for Professor Landua. Landua was an amateur biologist, and he was a Catholic priest. They threw him out, the Pope threw him out of the church. And he raised money for um, a zoological garden, and by having plays, games, plays, theater plays, in the local district, in the local language. And men were also in women role, so they were like on drag. And the basic scene is very simple. It's the postman comes, and he has some important message. And he says, okay, why don't you have a schnapps, you know? Oh, but on one leg, it's no good. You need another one. <laughs> then, because it's so good, a third one. So, you know. And then other people come, and women are men, and men are women. And these things are very stupid in a way, but fantastically uh, social. And the people sit to watch it. You can, you, you can not understand unless it's, you understand the local dialect. You drink as, as well. And then the whole thing, you know, it's like burning down the house. <laughs> and Richard Ravanesha, he came and he made a proposal in 1997 of a puppet theater game, a puppet he brought from other puppets like Americans. And then we found a teacher who taught his students in gymnasium to make a play and based on, on a, Greek, um, a Greek subject of a, a school for Latin and Greek and so on, a woman in humanistic gymnasium, to make this Greek play into a local language. So it has become kind of anthropological. In, in that sense, it makes sense to have a connection to Mount Chu or Johannesburg. So it was very political in the sense that I always try to not tell stories, but talk about form or abstraction or what is sculpture, you know. Because sculpture can also be something like Ed Reiner, you know, says sculpture is completely unnecessary because it's something which you can run into if you have, right? From his point of view, he was a great scholar of, you know, uh, oriental uh, sculpture, you know, but a kind of autonomous sculpture. So this I skipped, this is the Richard Serra work. This is interesting, Isa Genskin, that was 10 years later. And she did a very dialectical work. Maybe the next slide shows you not. Go back. So, so it's a university building for a, a library. This library has eight stories, three below ground, and the other ones above. Now, the ground board in Münster is very high. So instead of three, they have two only above, that we know. And then the whole thing is too high. So they have a stair going up, you can go into the library, and a stair going down for students who go to the cafeteria on the main front and the university with 55,000 students. So some people say, hey, what is this? You know, I walk up in order to walk down. So next to it is a very amazingly impressive building from the law faculty, which was designed in 1941 for the Nazi University in Berlin. And after the war, these people came with finished architectural plans. And they said, okay, we need a building like this. We built it right away. And all the kind of Nazi regalia were changed in a more kind of Catholic form. So indirectly, she reflects on this. 
and she built in concrete these elements with two big frames. And she wanted to have the in frame glass. And the secretary of Klaus Bosman, she said, this is not a good idea because the birds will fly against it. So we have to make birds in order. So there is no glass. And it was very, very, very beautiful because it's, it's a ruin. And it's very architecturally, and she played the trick. You go up and you go down, and you become like being in a performance. And there was a huge discussion. Should it stay or should it be taken down? We wanted it very much to stay because it cost so much money to take it down. <laughs> the idea was it is not to stay, but, but here we really fought very hard. And the president of the university, he did not like it. And his assistant, he knew that he was not going to be with the president anymore. He, in the discussion, said, Oh, I see. The president said, no, I don't like it because if I walk underneath it, I feel like walking under a guillotine. And the assistant said, dear president, you have never walked there because you have a car with a chauffeur and you have an entrance in the library from below. <laughs> so he knew that it was not going to work for him anyway. He was fired the same day. <laughs> and the piece was taken down. <laughs> so in this case, I'm already now thinking of reconstructing it. Maybe. This is a dangerous kind of notion. Of, uh, this is a typical sign of when you're getting old, right? You become sentimental. But it was very interesting for the technique of 68 and the following. You see, other people were kind of simplistic, using it as a career form, or saying you have no chance, make use of it. So, in a sense, it was a real public sculpture. And now it should be the best public sculpture from anywhere in the world. Here. So, also this is can be we see, and this is Lothar Baumgart. Lothar Baumgart is a very kind of well-read, very philosophical artist who deals with anthropological phenomena in Brazil. And uh, so he had a very ambitious project for a church and he wanted to, to change the roof. But it became too bureaucratic and too complicated and too expensive too. Sometimes the best art is not the most expensive art. So then he came up with an idea of putting three light bulbs in these three cages. Each light bulb has only 40 watts, which is very little. And these three cages are the cages of the Anabaptist, um, 1468. There was a movement after the Reformation of a very high Protestant group from Holland who took over the city of Münster and who were kind of anarchic and trying to establish new Jerusalem. The bishop, which was you know, thrown out of the town, eventually was able to blockade the city so they had no water, no food, and so on, and they had to give up. And then they were caught at a trial and were put into these cages. Three kings from Holland, Cliff and Dolly, and there are two operas about it. It's, it's a very uh, mysterious kind of situation. They say they failed because they opened up one that they could be with as many women as they wanted to. And they say that was the end of it. That was the end of the system. But that's in right? Because that was uh, too much. Jealousy of the one, but they didn't have any food or whatever. But it's very cruel. They were brought through this, the main street, put into these cages, and then the cages were lifted onto the church, and they were still alive, and the birds were eating them. Now, what we have is these three little lamps, which remind you of the dead souls. You have that in literature too, that they are full of. And when you are there, they say, in four in the morning, and you 
you have gone out and you train and you know the kids and then you see very fright, very fright. Because you have a photograph you couldn't see. You have to take a photo for 20 minutes. And it was very cheap, very cheap. Then it cost eight marks. Because the electric was done by an electrician company. So I think I'm running out of time. I want to show that, which is kind of playing on the architecture of the city and putting on top two cherries. Now, the cherries have the color of the cars, which at that time, for some reason, now all the cars seem to be black. So then the city wanted to buy it, they bought it, but then they threw out the cars. And Schütte said, no, I did it for the cars, because the cars are changing, and this is red. And it's true, today everything is black or silver. There's no red cars anymore, especially not in the inner city, because they're expensive stores. And the expensive cars, they are silver or black. Okay, this is a very political, I don't know to go into it. Okay, I hate to be interesting in a, um, a kind of a park where inside this things are just growing. A lot of marijuana, a lot of other stuff. And it's, it's a nice kind of a timepiece. Okay. Now, um, Aisha Alpun, a Turkish artist, she also made a proposal in relation to the casino. And the casino, this is very interesting. This is sarcastic. There's so many churches and so many people. And the church argues in a very intelligent way. They are theologians and they have a clear sense of what art is in relationship to their own kind of theological notion. But the contact between the church and the art is a bit complete. I mean, there are a few exceptions, like Henri Matisse or Corbusier and so on, but basically it's, it's one. But their sense of the argumentation on aesthetics is wonderful. So it's a good challenge, you know, to be in, in contact with the church. It's very intelligent. And, but you don't get away. So Aisha, she took sculptures which were part of the cathedral and have been changed because of the weather conditions and the, 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 the climate made by cars and found this is very soft stone from the area. So it's, it's for, for, for conservation, they take them down, make new ones, copies, and the old ones are in the museum. They did both the museum, some of the museum. So she took all these and flew them on a Sunday over the cathedral onto the museum. And the church has no right in the air about the cathedral. Right. And the idea is from uh, Fellini's film, you know, the Christians in the helicopter, and you see St. Peter. Oh. Now, Ilya Kabakov, that's interesting, he made this antenna at a lake where people do a lot of picnics and so on, and when you lie down, you can read, and you look into the sky, and what you see might be the most beautiful thing you ever experience in your life. So this is very popular, and there was a lot of popular reviews about the piece, quoting a German romantic poet. But it, it has stood up said, you know, to me, it's not a call for literature, but it sounds very much like a romantic German poet. Now, this is the third version, and this is where party time is going. So, Tobias Lebacher, for instance, he took this university building, which is an interesting lecture hall, just across from the cathedral, and made it into a bar. So he put red carpet, and he used these concrete things, which are basically an um, exhaust for, for air conditioning for the lecture hall, they made this into, into tools, and the bar was going on every night till about 11 with music 
and from the other crying. And people liked it. It was a hot summer, and people really liked it. And they wanted to, it to continue. I said, no, we are not running uh, this, but it's this is just for four months, that's it. But it was a nice piece, very pleasant, and a lot of uh, connection. Kasper Solis and Dorothy Newman, uh, you could uh, uh, okay. Now, Martin Kittenbacker, who is making a kind of a, an exhaust from a subway. Now, Münster is a city which has no subway. It's a provincial small town. Okay. Now, this I have to show because it's Namjoon Pike. Namjoon Pike did a great, great piece in 87. In a moat, he had a little, there was a kind of a, a steel table, more or less. And nobody knew what it was used for. Sometimes the room that was above, sometimes below. And there are ducks in this mode there. And Pike had another idea which was too expensive and it was maybe a little bit too, too affirmative. He said, oh, I like this. I have an empty uh, television in steel and I make Buddha myself. And we call it TV Buddha for ducks. Because the ducks would make the sun. It was very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. And the sculpture he made himself of Buddha looked like a geopometry. <laughs> I mean, he is practically with two left hands. You know, he just impossible. And it looked like a children, but a not a very successful sculpture of a child. But it was perfect, TV Buddha, sometimes. And it was also met with great respect because there's a kind of strong, especially from students, a notion for oriental thinking, for you know, uh, another kind of sense of time. Uh, here he did the exactly opposite. He had cars collected in America. His father was a collector of big American cars. Very rich, and he wanted to make an homage to his father. And this was financed by his son, so that what it made it possible that he had all these old cars bought in America, relatively cheap. None of those cars worked anymore, they had no motor and so on. But from Model T forward to cars from the 40s, from the 50s. And he, they're also very gray and silver. Inside the car, he has junk from the ocean. And you have one sound playing, which is Mozart's liquid, right? Which is like the perfect, the most, most wonderful commercial music. Right? It's classical, and, and people really loved it. Right? And it was the best kitsch ever. <laughs> But I think Pike is probably one of the most interesting. He was very influential. <coughs> in Pike, for instance, boys would have not done performances if it were not for Pike. So Pike is more like a philosopher, and he introduces ideas. So the art can be interesting. The most interesting art, in a way, have been those who are not artists, who just use the art to communicate intelligently. Okay, for you, George Blake, Pike, and so on. So, you have more and more kind of commercial art, which is very affirmative, which is made for collectors and for the art field and so on. But you also have other art, and you can't, one belongs to the other. It's all inter interconnected. So, okay. Uh, okay, this is an old thing. Now, this is a wonderful work of Daniel Doren. So, Daniel Doren was in the 60s together with Tomomi, Doren, and a group of, of conceptual kind of artists in Paris. And he's very intelligent, but he also has become now a big successful artist who is doing things all over the world. Some of it very baroque, some of it very kind of uh, uh, affirmative and beautiful and so on. But he's just now, he sort of like for the city of Münster, which once a year for carnival, 
they show these little flags with this, the colors of the city, white, red, and gold. And he is always using two colors, a color and a non-color, and always using stripes. So he said, why don't we put my flag there? And it was fantastic because people were there. It's not common. It's like you have a Christmas tree out there and you want to be out there. It's, it's not that. And we create a kind of a beautiful interior space. So again, it is very local and it's very global. Got a bit out. This one or? Dominic Gonzalez first, I'm also going to be part of burning down the house. She made, after 40 years, and she had been there twice. I have to know her uh, since she was 18 because she was going to a seminar and uh, teach at the art school. And she made a kind of a flashback on the history of the exhibition. So you see, it's against them. You see, the class all the work I mentioned. Uh, this is a work of different kinds of In English, all in scale. And people who hated the exhibition in 77 violently are going there now with their grandchildren or their children and talk about they talk about something which is only symbolic, it has no meaning other than art. But it's very important, a kind of communication. And quite a number of my colleagues, especially colleagues I've worked with, who are very formalist, became very angry at me. Why do I allow to make fun of Richard Seth? He said, it's a good reason to make fun. You know, they're all over. And the original idea basically turns against itself. So art is very vulnerable and that's why it is so important to have vulnerability. It's very, very essential even for people who do not know that they need art. We do need it essentially. So thank you. I'm sorry to take it. Thank you very much for presentation and comment about the uh, art in uh, connecting the issue with art. So let me now introduce the, the third groundbreaker invited for this uh, symposium, uh, Mr. Hu Han Ru, who made many shows around the world. I think he, he curated something like 20 biennials or something like this. And, uh, but he's been invited here to talk about uh, this uh, show that he organized in uh, 1997 and running the show running in 2000 together with Ansu Shuku Obris, the co-director of Serpentine Gallery. And this show, Cities on the Move, was uh, focusing very much about the transformation of the city in Asia. It was the first big important show dealing with this issue. It was really a groundbreaking event and then the show that they he made together with uh, with Aubrey's. So please uh, you can come here to the desk and thank you. Thank you Marie. Um, well, thank you um, again thank you very much Yigong Wu and also, uh, the people of Guangzhou, again, you know, for me, this is um, a, a very, um, a very um, familiar place. It's almost like a family place because um, I have been um, laboring here for um, a few times, especially, um, but time goes very quickly. Um, Twelve years ago, I was um, a co-curator of the Biennale here, and. Um, uh, I remember I was staying in a very typical Korean place, which was uh, at the time. Uh, Kasper just said that you know every ten years there's a change. Um, actually, ten years ago, um, Guangzhou was much less uh, um, uh, 
developed in terms of tourism. So there was no hotels. There's only one hotel which is called Prada or something. And, and the other is um, um, basically, you know, um, um, temporary places. So we were put into um, a very nice house, which is nearby here, uh, walking distance, which is a, a temporary housing for the migrant workers. Um, it was really uh, wonderful. I remember we were, we were sleeping in a, uh, a room where basically the, the heater, the water heater was like uh, working 50 times, uh, 50 percent of its time. Um, so you, sometimes you, you take a shower, it's cold, sometimes it's super hot. It's great. And this is a really wonderful experience that, um, you know, um, exactly uh, why I mention this is because this is um, uh, a part of the change in reality that you can see how Asia, as the, you know, Oprah oh, just mentioned that um, Asia has been changing so quickly. There's um, a possibility to call it the century of Asia, but indeed, you know, in the 90s, um, um, it's already um, um, a time that you know after the, the um, end of the Cold War. Um, and not only um, this relationship between the West and the, and, 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 uh, the Soviet, ex-Soviet uh, camps were changing, but also what is really important is the, the race of um, Asia-Pacific region in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of, of its economic power and also the cultural power. So, um, so um, talking about Asia became um, a, a necessity for uh, people who have good sides of the, um, the changes in the art world. Um, so what is interesting is in 1997, at the time I was um, with Hans Ulrich, um, both uh, were living in Paris. Um, we we um, met each other quite regularly and talked about you know, uh, what we have been you know, researching on um, the change of uh, the art scene. And, um, the, of course, you know, naturally, uh, the, the, the Asian scene came to our discussion. And one day, Hans Ulrich um, just called me uh, to say, uh, let's have a coffee and talk about something. And then he told me that he got an invitation from um, the Vienna uh, Secession, which is one of the oldest um, contemporary art uh, institutions in Europe, um, to organize an exhibition to celebrate the 100 years of the establishment of this institution. As you know about um, uh, the Vienna Secession, um, it's one, perhaps one of the uh, earliest uh, avant-garde uh, uh, um, art center today, we, we might call it, an, an avant-garde um, organization um, in Vienna, uh, created in the end of the um, 19th century to as a as a site as for a group of artists resisting to the academic conservative uh, art of the time and really trying to create a, a space of independence and and so this is why it's called secession basically basically is manifesting this idea of separating from the church of, um, I think church come, always comes back um, as Casper also mentioned that you know church is gone with modernity but um, it remains there, and today we are also talking about you know, um, how to how to create a new separation from the establishment. Um, so, so at the at the time um, they decided to celebrate um, the 100 years of uh, the funding of this place uh, with two projects. One is, of course, uh, very uh, naturally, is a kind of retrospective um, exhibition of uh, what has happened in this building. Um, so it was curated by Robert Fleck, who's um, uh, originally from Austria. And then um, another one they wanted to do is, to the surprise of, of everyone at the time, is to do a show on Asia. And so very naturally, um, Hans Hush just came to me and said, why don't we just do it together? Um, because um, you have the knowledge of uh, the field. And then very quickly we decided to work together. It was in the, I think, February of 1997. And the show was supposed to be at the um, October, November of um, um, uh, the same year. So we had basically um, 
nine months to prepare everything. And at the time, it was really also very interesting that um, there were a few events um, happened. I was, by chance, working with Oku and Facebook at the same time on also on the Johannesburg Biennale in 1997. So Johannesburg Biennale happened in, um, in the summer. And uh, at the time, I was working on a project called Hong Kong, etc. And Hong Kong, etc. was um, a project that has uh, multiple, um, multiple um, uh, phases. Uh, it's a very small um, exhibition in uh, several sites in, in Johannesburg. Um, in the theater and then also in the uh, scientific museum. And then next to it, uh, there is um, an extension into the townships of uh, uh, Johannesburg uh, with intervention of um, uh, video works in different public venues like restaurants, meeting points, and community houses and so on uh, for people who are actually uh, not uh, having a chance to come into the city center. And then and another part was really early. In 1997, um, perhaps it's one of the first exhibitions with a website. So, um, so another part of the project was on the website. The main theme of um, this uh, project was related to the question uh, that Hong Kong was in transition in 1997, was in the transition from a British colony being handled back to China. So there's a tra transfer of the, of the ownership of this place, the tra a huge transfer of um, um, uh, history as well as the ending of uh, the last colonial, uh, colonial uh, uh, um, um, uh, occupation of an uh, important place in Asia. And also the case of Hong Kong tells us a, a, such an interesting story about what Asia today would be. It's Hong Kong, um, for the first time in the history of uh, colonialism, became a city which was more developed, more uh, wealthy than the colonizer, than um, the UK. And also it's a city in which has generated an incredibly rich and open culture based on a, a hybrid cultural identity. And which is uh, what we later on call it the post-colonial uh, effect. And I, I think, you know, uh, what we can learn from this um, history is to say that um, the negotiation of um, uh, Asian cultures and, and nations uh, can, uh, for its own process of modernization, actually uh, suggest us uh, an incredibly interesting new perspective, which is to reinvent a new modernity which is based on a very uh, complicated, very complex negotiation and, and struggle against the domination of colonial, but creating a, um, a, a, creating a, a, a new energy and to invent another possibility to, be con to conceive a, a modern society. And based on that, it could be a very uh, incredibly uh, uh, fertile and, and energetic context for uh, imagination and creation in all fields. And this has been clearly trans translated in not only in visual art and also in architecture, urbanism, and film industry, and uh, performance art, and, and many, many uh, aspects and especially in terms of the way of living the people in this place, and which is having um, such an incredible influence on the next step of modernization in, in China. Um, and so there's um, a real uh, new perspective that one can think about the question of uh, the tension between, uh, the, tension between um, the colonial past and the and the, current, the contemporary struggle for uh, efforts for uh, modernization. And what kind of new understanding of uh, modernity can be uh, produced out of this process? So um, in the meantime, in the, in the 90s, what is also interesting is it was a time that the curators 
of our generation um, after the generation of uh, uh, Casper start looking also at um, uh, some very uh, experimental approaches to to uh, curating. So Hans Ulrich was also working on the project um, um, uh, from you know starting from his kitchen, and I was working on the project um, uh, starting from my corridor in my little apartment, and so on. And, and in the meantime, we both were working on the idea of laboratory. So Hans Ulrich was also working on a larger project um, on a laboratorium. Uh, laboratorium and combining science, experiments, and philosophy, sociology, and, and art together. So all this combined together, actually, we find ourselves in in front of an exciting, incredibly exciting new reality. So we take on this project uh, um, to celebrate the 100 years of secession, to create an, another succession, let's say, to uh, depart for a new adventure. So very quickly, um, we came up with this um, uh, project called Cities on the Move. Um, what is, um, again, what, what is interesting is um, that the case of Hong Kong uh, shows us also one very important thing is um, what actually happening in, in Asia at the time is a modernization and also a kind of integration into the so-called globalization through um, uh, urban development. And this became and the most important drive, driving force in terms of, uh, uh, not only in terms of social development, also uh, culture change. So, so we find out that the, the most exciting thing happening was not simply, uh, was not simply, you know, uh, uh, things happened in the galleries and museums. Anyway, at the time there was no galleries or museums, almost now, uh, for many countries, uh, in, in, uh, uh, to support contemporary art. But more, it's um, activities that starting from the street directly, starting from the urban context. The artists actually organize themselves really to uh, produce the most um, um, Exciting projects to intervene into the uh, respond and intervene into the urban change. So this becomes also the, the most important context for us. And then, uh, well, there's a long story. And, and at the same time, um, there starting having also a few projects in other uh, museums in in the world, especially uh, one uh, project called uh, Tradition and Tension curated by uh, Apinen um, Oshinanda from Thailand for the uh, Asia Society. And, and that was also in, uh, one of the major representations of Asian contemporary art at the time. Um, what is interesting is that we find that the project was very spectacular, very interesting, but based on this idea of identity policy, right? basically it's really to, to project a kind of um, an Asian identity based, based on this um, very, uh, today we might call it an exotic kind of reading of the relation between modernity and tradition. So that uh, became quite, um, you know, problematic way of reading. So we decided to really uh, to look into uh, the question of Asia, not simply as a question of identity and as an object of uh, being read, uh, in an exotic way, continuing with this kind of traditional museology um, um, or, or anthropological kind of relationship between the mainstream and the periphery, as Oakley also mentioned. But what was really important for us is to look at how Asia is not simply a uh, image being represented through this kind of uh, uh, anthropological kind of cliché, but it's an a inevitable, indispensable uh, uh, part of the construction of a new world, which is a coming, which is a, a active, if not the most important, and um, it must be one of the most important elements in terms of 
creating a global contemporary uh, identity and, 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 and contemporaneity. Uh, and so, in this case, um, the, the possibility of uh, representation becomes problematic. The notion of representation becomes uh, problematic. What we really intended to do is to create a, a project that actually becomes a, a process of presenting what has happening and also what is ongoing. So we decided to create an exhibition which is not simply a selection of existing works to be represented there as an illustration of what Asian identity might be, but, but creating a, a kind of new context, a kind of new playground in which uh, ongoing projects are happening. So uh, we decided to call this uh, project Cities on the Move. Actually, you can really uh, look into the notion the city becomes the central point of uh, uh, what a new modernity is being invented. And then on the move, meaning that this project is not simply a kind of a static representation of what is there, but it's about uh, being present and also projecting into the future in a constant movement. And this, of course, um, is corresponding to uh, the reality that we have been observing that um, the process of urban development and in Asia ha has this incredibly um, uh, speed, uh, incredible kind of um, mobile uh, energy, and it's all, everything is in process. And in the meantime, it's also an open process that um, uh, the question of nation states is being questioned. Uh, the question of the notion of nation states is being deconstructed, uh, taking, taken over by um, the presence of this, the city culture and the urban. And how this urban actually is providing a new political framework for us to think about um, the existence of artists. And on the other hand, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, collaborations between art and architecture, urbanism, and other fields becomes um, a possibility for us to redefine what contemporary creation would be. So we decided not to limit ourselves into the arts, but really uh, 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 working and from really uh, many, many different kinds of um, uh, disciplines. So we decided to put art, architecture, and, and um, other disciplines together. And on the other hand, um, it is um, an, an exhibition that uh, also trying to present the possibility in terms of new way of curating. And this new way of curating is based on the idea that um, beyond representation, what can be can be created a, a presence of a city. A micro, a micro city being reinvented inside the, the framework of the institution, and then go beyond that. So for Vienna, we started with the um, with the process um, of creating not only um, an exhibition but really a, a city space in which events are happening constantly, and this. Um, this actually uh, represents um, uh, also an incredibly interesting way of how Asian cities are being uh, uh, reinvented beyond the traditional rule of modernist urban planning. And so it's um, a hybrid body, uh, a, 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 a process of creating a hybrid body between a very high density kind of um, uh, living space and and different kind of um, uh, logic of uh, development from Tabra Rasa kind of uh, erasing the past to re to reinventing a, 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 a tradition and so on and so forth. So it's um, an incredibly kind of um, a combination of different systems of urban de development. This is what made uh, the Asian city not only uh, developing very fast but also uh, extremely uh, creative. So 
that um, challenges a lot of um, established rules of um, urban planning. And on the other hand, it gives us an, a possibility to change the institutional framework itself. So we decided to invite artists from, from Asia, but also artists or architects who are operating in Asia. Um, this is also a very important uh, aspect of the project. Is we recognize Asia not only as a kind of racial, ethnic uh, kind of um, uh, notion, but it's a, a typology of um, a society in which um, different uh, people from different cultural origins, different countries, can participate in inventing. So we decided to invite an artist uh, who are living in Asia, who come to Asia to work and also architects who operate uh, in Asia. Um, um, that was also the beginning of this um, a generation of us. Today we call them star architects. Uh, starting, they are realizing their um, uh, idealist utopian projects. Um, Asia was maybe the only place in, in the time that can provide the context, the material conditions for them to realize this project. So people like Zaha Hadi, Graham Kuhas, or, and so on and so forth, um, Hezo de Meron and so on, start actually researching and building things in Asia. Uh, so we decided to really, to understand Asia not only as um, a regional or geographic uh, notion, but a, a, a new typology of development. So that, has an incredibly important kind of global sense. So uh, very quickly, maybe we, and then we, we decided to uh, develop this project um, by um, realizing, um, practicing a kind of urban, urban planning process, starting with a de design of an architect, uh, Yu Ho Chang from, uh, from uh, Beijing. I think he also uh, was curating, was participating in um, here um, in the Design Biennale, and also he designed the, the Guangzhou Biennale 2002 um, uh, with us. Um, and then um, this becomes a um, uh, very interesting uh, beginning of the, uh, of the um, uh, Cities on the Move project. So in the middle of the secession, um, um, Yong He provided us some uh, uh, urban, urban structure uh, in which um, reminding the uh, traditional Chinese city, uh, which is a square. And in, in the meantime, he introduced a whole system of pre uh, presentation with a very, very high density um, of artworks. So, so the, this incredibly kind of um, high density of, of display of works uh, provided a, a, a very direct connection with the um, tradition of a high density in the Asian cities. And that, again, you know, provoked a lot of discussion and debates um, because that challenges completely the, the logic of exhibition, especially defies the question of the autonomy of art, art objects. So today we were just talk, hanging around this, in the uh, Biennale uh, uh, um, space, imagining, because the works are not up, but uh, imagining that the interference of between different works in terms of sound, in terms of image, and so on. And because we, we are still, you know, uh, believing this kind of autonomy of the separation of different works. Um, and in this case of uh, Cities on the Move, we actually try to push um, the situation to another extreme, which is to encourage the mixture, the collaboration, and also the mixture, the hy hybridization amongst different hours, different artists. So they, they come together as a collective. Um, it's like how we live in an Asian city, in a constant kind of uh, interchangeable relationship with, with the other. So, and then, and then, um, how can I go back? And then, um, Zhang Mohe's um, um, design provides us not only a, a physical frame of the city uh, typology, but also a possibility for us to introduce different ac 
activities into the exhibition. So because of this introduction that the, the exhibition is open to different kind of activities, starting from the installation process, uh, we, we have the artists coming to invest in this in the place, they basically uh, live inside the space during the preparation of the exhibition. So they were cooking, smoking, drinking in the whole process. And then what is interesting is the outcome of the, um, uh, the exhibition becomes a kind of ongoing events, accumulating everyday life, um, every, everyday life process, the process of conception, the process of uh, realization and also the process of derealization and so on. And then even we are open um, to a possibility of having the public to participate, not only in terms of participating in the performance and so, and so on, but also we allow them to rent this space for different kind of activities, from you know family dinner to wedding and so on. So during the, the exhibition process, uh, this becomes a city in which a real urban life happened, and um, very quickly. Um, so, in the meantime, we also tried to uh, develop a, a relationship. Sorry, I have to go back very quickly um, between the institution and the community in the city. So, we not only invited artists from Asia, but also we invited uh, artists and other people coming from the city of Vienna to join uh, the project. Uh, with a uh, several project that involved uh, being a kind of uh, a stimulator of this uh, collaboration. So for example, this is uh, a ongoing project by Navin Raban Chaiku and um, uh, um, Rikrit Tilavani. Uh, they created a kind of role movie talking about a story of a, um, a Thai boy traveling uh, on his tuk-tuk of this, um, of this, um, uh, this uh, tricycle, uh, the Thai taxi, driving through different cities in Europe to, uh, to make friends. And so this is a, a fiction film, and then they, they continue to develop this project, through, not through a film itself, but through a, a um, comic book. So, so all this project um, started um, Again, the process of preparation um, brings us to um, a, a different kind of invention of the format of the exhibition, uh, from the exhibition itself to the publication. So, for example, this is the, the catalog, the first edition of the catalog, uh, and in which we accumulate, uh, at the time we didn't have, everyone, um, some of us had emails, most of them, uh, still didn't have emails, so we used fax. Maybe you don't remember what fax is. So I still have the, the original fax in my file, which is like this thick. Um, so we actually exchanged fax with the artist, and at the end, we made the catalog in a very, very short time, less than three weeks, to make a catalog of six, uh, 400 something pages, on with fax. And then this exhibition continues to travel as a traveling city, you can see very quickly. Um, the second step was going to uh, CAPC in France, Bordeaux, and you can see that the exhibition has been completely reconfigurated. And every time we have a, a core group of artists travel with the project, and every time they invent new works for the project. And then, this is the second publication, and then they went to PS1 in New York, which, which was a virtual version of the, of the exhibition. We didn't have money to ship the works to New York, and so we decided to create a project which is uh, mainly based on slides and video projections. Maybe you don't remember what slide is, but this is the very beautiful slideshow. And then um, we didn't have money to make a new catalog, we, we just reinvented a new catalog overnight, the night before the opening, we asked artists to send us new facts, and then we make a, a publication out of that. And then we went to uh, Louisiana Museum in Denmark, and this is um, 
in a very different kind of a display situation uh, because the, the, the museum is like a garden museum it's very long and very open to nature so we reconfigure it, uh, the exhibition in a very very different way and then again we invent uh, in that this is the official publication on the on the right hand on the left hand was uh, invented version of the um, uh, new catalog. So we have two catalogs. So this one uh, was also designed by uh, the Chinese artist Chen Zhen. And then the exhibition went to um, a paper gallery in London. And what happened is um, we invited Ram Kuhas and all his children to work together to uh, redesign the exhibition. So uh, what we did is actually they, they spent um, a lot of time to do research on the project. So they, they decided to recycle what was already in place as an architecture structure. It was designed by, there was an exhibition of a Russian avant-garde fashion um, uh, designed by Zaha Hadid. <coughs> so you can see these elements, typically Zaha Hadid. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just one second, I think it is very important. Very, very important. Yes. Because it, it, I think it's very good for the Vietnam to do this. Yes. Just one second. Uh, and so Rampu has decided to turn around the elements designed by Zahadit uh, uh, to make a new structure for the exhibition. So he basically turned them upside down, and then it becomes a new, new possibility for us to. And then he created a a chamber, a torture chamber of architecture. So to show the architectural models, he, instead of showing them in the correct way, he actually piled them up all together, like a, like a one installation. So it's like becoming a, a, a torture of architecture. And then this is the, uh, this is also very interesting, as the exhibition also came back to Asia. So it was in Bangkok. Instead of making an, ex an exhibition, it doesn't make sense to recreate the city, Asian city, inside Asian city. So we decided to not to make an exhibition, but make a, an urban event. So we worked with about 50 different venues in Bangkok. During, um, during one month, it's like a big festival happening in the city. And then this is the publication. And there's also some very interesting antiquity here. You can see the publication is a box with postcard publication and, and posters and so on. But you have um, a cassette, a VHS um, video cassette. I don't, I don't know if you remember this kind of very ant antiquity kind of device. And then um, the last step of the exhibition was in Helsinki, Kiasma, designed by uh, Shigeru Ban. And she, that was the first time that Shigeru actually had a collaboration with the art community. Um, this is the last part of the publication. So, so the Cities on the Move, it's becoming, it's like an a, a ongoing machine that produced many, many possibilities, including exhibition models, um, new typology of doing exhibitions and publication and so on. And what is also the most important thing is he created a, a huge ongoing community of artists and that who are coming from Asia and also going uh, to reach out to the local communities. And many, many collaborations have been uh, continued after the, uh, the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have this presentation and given that to the member of that citizen who was able in some way to reproduce the concept of modernity coming from Asia in the general discussion, international discussion, where the uh, Western world was pretty much in a kind of mud with Western world. So I think that was even a very great achievement. So please, we have now.
Real nice. Okay. on 
constructivist art and photography was the beginning of the century. So, and I have a very high respect for a kind of scholarly uh, view. You see, I'm not an art historian. So I'm, I'm, I'm nothing in terms of academics. I, I studied anthropology, but I never finished it. So, yes, I was interested, and I made a proposal on a very subjective point of view. I was much more interested in the Eremitage than I was in the manifesto. But I clearly said that even in my paper. There were two other people who were also asked, also some I had in the scenes experience that I did. So I didn't write the paper in order to win. I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a manifest, I'm not a Biennale person at all. So, um, when I signed the contract, it took me two and a half months to work on the contract with a lawyer who I paid, at least half of it, and I had a translation made in Russian because I didn't trust them at all. So they were translated maybe in a way which is completely different than the opposite of what I'm trying to say. And then a young man was recommended to me who was living in Berlin and who was doing his dissertation there in Russian. And it turned out he worked in the Ehren plant for six years. And he left. So I said, why don't you come along, go back with me, you know. And so I was able to, to take an initiative to hire people. They're all about between 28 and 35. And for instance, when I went with him to the cafeteria in the Ehrenitage, there are 3,000 people working there, alone 800 art historians or archivists or whatever. And people are very happy to see him an old copy of the boss ignore it because you do not leave the Ehrenitage. It's a palace. It's very aristocratic. So, when I signed my contract, there was a new law being passed against homosexual propaganda, which is a completely vicious Absolutely existential, but you, it has to be 
responsible. So there are a lot of people on, 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 on the internet and so on, you know, who, who call about boycott and say, I'm boycotting the show and not participating. People haven't even been invited, you see. Or people, in two or three cases, who have been invited in a very formal way, that's a collective, which put it on social media that they're boycotting the show. So in a very old-fashioned way, I said, look, I sent you an invitation, inviting, by registered mail. It's a collective of 60 people. We discussed it four times, who is participating, who is going to do it. There were three names. I sent each one of them an invitation. I said, you can do it however you decide. They accepted the invitation, they were invited, they got the money, and so on. And if they make a protest on the internet, I said, we pull out. I said, why don't you tell me? I have other things to do than just always look into the internet. So it's a question of how you deal with each other, of formalities. But formalities become very, very important. For instance, the, the, the talk, which is interesting. Okay. I would never do this unless it's life, right? I'm quite often now invited for television in relationship to this. And I say, okay, but only life, because things are changing all the time. And things which seem to have a meaning, and you don't know the context, can be mis misconstrued in another way. So it is really interesting that art now in the last two or three years is in a way less interesting and more interesting. And I'm more interested in when it becomes more interesting, when it means something again. You have such a huge overall kind of art world and that integrates everything. But I'm part of Mr. Art World, otherwise I wouldn't be here. You see, the Biennale, everything becomes submerged and this is okay. We are living today and you know this is for instance the cities on the move. When I saw the catalog, I saw the show in Helsinki, I saw it in London, and I was very intrigued because I would have liked to see it four times. But with Bordeaux, when I didn't see it Bordeaux, I know the space, I suddenly realized why it was very good for Bordeaux because this fantastic bottle of wine, very high prices, could not survive unless Asian who means would buy it. It's so goddamn expensive, it's so fantastic. But without their Japanese and Chinese and Korean customers, people in Europe wouldn't pay that kind of money anymore. Right? So things are very complex and different than they seem to look like. And so, anyway, what is interesting about this exhibition is that there is a real charming boycott. The, the ladies who take care of the museum, of the Ellen Blanche, you know, they close the door, they tell people, no, you don't want to see it, this is your the boys of the German Nazi, uh, blah, blah, but very friendly, elegant. So in a way, things are changing. The director is an orientalist. He's fantastic. Petrovsky. He's very, he has a very different look upon things because he's an orientalist. He's a diplomatic person. He's supporting the exhibition, but he never gets involved in technicalities. He's the president. He's a god. He's a czar. He doesn't say he's a big
and there was more in Gitan, and they felt like very existentialist, and they wanted to leave bourgeois Belgium to visit many, many, many. So the car broke down in Germany, West Germany, not in East Germany. So they left the car and hitchhiked the Germany. Now, when he was invited by then, by Edinburgh, which turned back into Petersburg, he remembered this trip. So they found a car on the internet, a Lada from 30 years ago. It's green, which is just a coincidence, but the editing touch is <coughs> So it took three and a half days to drive from Antwerp to St. Petersburg. On the Monday morning at 8.30, they drove into the inner court where the entrance is. You see, the enemy college doesn't have an entrance because it's made at a palace. They started to drive in with a carriage. And the people who worked there came in from the kitchen from the back. There's no kitchen at all. So, this was agreed upon, it took a long time, the director signed it, yes, they come in 30, the film is being made, the museum is closed, on Tuesday the museum is open again, they drove in, and they immediately called the police, the director was in Moscow, they called him, he had signed it, everything was clear, and he said, no, wait till I'm back, then, I was not in Lenin at the time. And they said, go ahead, because otherwise he would have to go back to Mexico City. The crew, his film crew wouldn't be there. On the next day, it's impossible because there's a big line of people visiting the museum, and it would have not happened. They don't say no, they always have excuses. So, I wasn't even involved in. But later on, I said, I over the phone told him you have to do it in order to protect my colleagues there because they would be thrown out of me. That's a Soviet type system. I made an interview for the radio and explained the whole situation and said, unfortunately, this civil disobedience was eight months too late. And then the Cold War started again. So Petrovsky, who had said, you know, Gordon Michael, suddenly, I mean, it was, it wasn't anyone he called by my first name, his secretary would call me and said, you know, uh, Professor uh, Petrovsky wants to talk to you one at a time. And I said, Maria, why do you call me? Dr. Coombs, I don't have a doctor. Then she said, Professor, before we call each other, our first name, wonderful woman, very, very good, and she did have a doctor on that office. She was a really smart person. And then I said, you know, Professor, without a doctor, it's cheap. And then she said on the phone,
And I want to ask him this question, even making reference and connection with what we said before in this conversation. I want to hear your opinion. Do you think that Asia became the real protagonist of the art debate in this century, this in short term? But I would like that you articulate a bit this issue, because I think even we are, we are in Guangzhou, the major Biennale in Asia, so I mean, I think it's the right place to ask you this question. Thank you. I, I would see, of course, this is very gender, general questions, really large questions, difficult to say. But I think Asia, the importance of Asia, uh, the Asian scene, I guess, there, there is um, a few things. Uh, especially, I think it's not, um, definitely, it's one of the main actors. Uh, but also, it's one of the main symptoms. Um, maybe the most problematic place for, for art because um, um, probably the, the, the development of the art scene in Asia becomes so spectacular and so, so quick, so rapid that um, and that, that shows exactly how today the world is moving towards a highly problematic reality, and Asia is like the uh, the most excited, crazy man in the world with all the possibility of generating uh, all kind of alternative things, all kind of um, imaginative fantasy, and so on. But also, it shows the profound problematic of lack of integrity, lack of, um, lack of, um, uh, um, I would say, the, the real capacity to, to turn the fantasy into something meaningful. So, I think that's the challenge. So, in a way, um, I, I would not say um, it's not important, it's really important when one knows uh, how to negotiate with the, the problem. So, so I would say, um, I don't know how to answer your question actually, it's really, um, um, but that said, because it's a, it's a, a problem, problematic situation, it's also a, a situation that one can generate many, many possibilities, many inventive solutions. And what is important is not to lose this opportunity to catch this uh, this um, um, opportunity. For example, now there are many many museums being built in, in Asia, and but I guess you know, 12 years ago when I was working for the Biennale here, the, the main reason of that project. Uh, was to say that the Biennale is a possible, this Biennale shows a possibility of providing another way of thinking about infrastructure. Um, one should not simply repeat the same kind of museums, um, but we can really rethink this, this possibility of extending the, the Biennale into a permanent structure that make sense for us to rethink the relationship between artistic production and social memory. And when we talk about museums, about the kind of collective memory of a momentum, right? And we very often forget this key mission of the museum. We tend to just turn it into a simple um, apparatus kind of uh, bureaucratic machine to preserve something that is not justifying the importance of the momentum of creation, but justifying simply the necessity, the, 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 the bureaucratic necessity of itself. So I think um, this question, um, what well, is really interesting that um, now Asia has so many new museums are being built especially you know, after the 80s in Japan, the 90s in Korea, now in China. You have 
5,000 museums are being built, and there's absolutely no preparation, no uh, expertise. But how to handle this situation? It's really interesting. I think uh, it's a it's a moment that we need to really introduce another way of thinking about about what um, um, how theoretically um, what the, um, the ethic of museums should be and the ethic of being artist should be. I think that um, is a real challenge today in Asia and um, more than in other places because the, the situation is much more dynamic, much more intense. This has very interesting interesting conclusion I think, and even point that you focus on. Uh, so now we have 10 minutes for the question from the audience. So uh, I think that there uh, is someone that would like to ask a question. So just uh, can you give him a microphone, please? Yes, please. Uh, so then, And I think museums are fantastic institutions 
because they have time warping issues. You go and you look at something which impressed you when you were a teenager, 16, 17. And now you go again and you don't know what made it so fascinating for you at the time. So what is groundbreaking is a postcard which I bought next door that we are of generation which we have participated the disappointment of an aesthetic awareness to actually physically be confronted with the work of Marcel Duchamp is a very positive experience because you know aesthetics is more than just a paintbrush and a beautiful peach a new one even painted by Red Warren. And it's a very big mistake when you build all these museums, private collections, at a kind of, hey, look how much money I paid for the wall, how much money I paid for the bar and you, and so on. It's a simplistic view. However, the, the education through a museum is amazing. My most favorite museum, I'm a real fan, is the Los Angeles County Museum. It's a museum without a history. It's not the museum of what not. They behave like the Kremlin and the fucking Vatican in one. They are responsible for the history of art. This is very boring. It's the best museum in the world, yes, modernism. But it's also they are defending something which is not theirs. They are not the artists. We are poor. We are not the artists. But the groundbreaking also means that you make things available on an intelligent level. There's a lot of arrogance about tourism, of people who feel there are too many tourists. Hundred years ago, very few people were even able to, to go on holidays around the world. Tourism is a fantastic fantastic, wonderful, democratic uh, accomplishment with a lot of side effects. But we can choose ourselves when we go and what we can afford. So I think it's completely essential to talk about the reflection of 20 years of Guangzhou. This is the only place I know of where an art exhibition happened because of politics. You see, the most favorite, and then I stop, exhibition, which I, I have great respect for, which I only know from history, is an exhibition which was done in 1929 in Stuttgart. And it was about new architecture. And the architects had a, had a problem. They had to deal with what, how does it look for a family, women, two children, and grandparents, the man was gone because he died in the First World War. What of a, a couple which has divorced and so on. So on a sociological social level. Now this Zondel Backwood exhibition is very famous now for aesthetic reasons. It's in every book on art history of the 20th century. Nobody talks about the social issue. It just happens to be that Kowalski, Ava Alto, all the great architects were there, Corpius. So it's recognized as an artistic event, but it just happened to be that the people who saw it were very intelligent, and they asked the most intelligent people who were thinking about architecture in a new way. So it's not only an artistic event, but it's a very significant social event. And this is a problem which we always have to deal with. You know, what's social, what's aesthetics? This is always a process. And the most important thing is a groundbreaker, if you call this, has a responsibility not to take himself too serious. Art is very, very important, but we have, don't have to take it in a false way important. It's really important. Love is important. Peace is important. You know, good food is important. Water is important. So things which are very important to us, we all have an emotional relationship to. 
We have to protect the way like a baby is contracted by the mother. So it's very important not to get into this dogma, get religious. Put it up on, on a pedestal. So I'm very happy that I had a tie in my suit, you know, because I think Oakley has a good formal way of presenting art. And it's also a question of style. And thank God we are so many different people with each person in their own You know, it's not one world. No, this is ridiculous. For instance, for me, it's very difficult to understand why North and South Korea, I remember the first time I was here, people would talk to me because at that time there was East Germany and West Germany. Now that doesn't exist anymore. But it seems to be a very private emotion. I think these cultures have a very important message to overcome fear, to overcome mistrust. You know, people have to, in order to make the world survive, they have to talk to each other. They don't have to like each other. That's not necessary. I'm happy to go to a museum because I'm happy to be with people I don't know. I don't even have to know. I really don't want to know. There is a kind of almost erotic charge. It's nice to be with people you don't know. It's we are like a collective. We are like animals in a way. You know, back to the planet of the apes. So it's very important to have civilization and art can help not to change or change or make the world better, but it certainly can make it more complex as it is. So I, I don't mind, you, obviously you have a problem with this, with this meaning of groundbreaker. I don't see it in a, in a pathetic way, I just see it very non-practical. Thank, Thank you for your point, sir. And then uh, we want to make a reply to the question why the system there was so important. Uh, I think Casper already using his own experience and his body language, his language, already answered the question what the 68 means. And clearly it's someone who has been living through 68. Uh, but in a way, I was two years old. <laughs> no, no, you see, I left Germany, and when I returned, people would always say to each other, call each other by their first name, which I didn't like. So I was not part of this ideological 16 Because there are many people in 16 who used it as a stepping point for a career. The most boring people you have in Germany are those who made a career as managers, politicians, and so on, professors because of 68. They tell the students today, why aren't you enough political? Yeah, I try to move it. Well, let's show it. Maybe, maybe I just make a little comment on this 68 story. Uh, it's true that I was two years and a half, 68. Um, but um, at the time, actually, my childhood was real 68, the origin of 68 was the Cultural Revolution in China. And that's another picture. And today when you think about this, um, there was a kind of romanticizing of what happened in China, clearly. And 68 was the Western bourgeoisie trying to find this uh, self-salvation, let's say, uh, call it that way, or redemption, right? After the war, after all the dramas and so on, and trying to redeem from this guilt by um, by um, um, kind of assimilate to a certain idea of revolution that was not uh, that the origin of this revolution was not that uh, uh, promising, let's say. But on the other hand, um, this interesting um, translation or mistranslation gives us a, a really interesting example of the idea of of the origin and the translated version um, could also be uh, this decalage or this shift, this difference can also be a very productive kind of force. Just like um, Casper was was talking about um, loss in translation, right? Um, 
And in this, of course, if I was a Japanese, I would be very unhappy to be, you know, make joke of, and, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, I think that forces to think how to approach a, a kind of um, 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 very grave, very, say, uh, very serious question of um, uh, civilization um, in a more civic way. And this is also very important. What we learn from the 6th day is not only simply the moment of this bourgeois protest, but also next to it you have the workers' movement. And more important is also you have the, the kind of emancipation of the whole society. Um, that you like to call people by their first name or not, but there's emancipation. And this emancipation change completed the paradigm of civilization itself. And this is why 68 is so important as a metaphor. And of course you can connect it to the whole context of um, um, the, the uh, civic uh, movement in America, you are living in America, and, and so on and so forth, and also that has a long preparation. And the, the Cultural Revolution in China didn't come from nowhere. It came from a very long preparation of the movement of the Third World, the movement of the post-colonial struggle, and so on. And, and if we don't really relate it to this, we cannot understand the importance of the idea of revolution, and also the, the destiny, even the failure of this, uh, this revolution. From there, how we can build another more civilized society out of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Yungo, uh, for this very precise reply. Uh, I'm sorry that the country, we are already out of the time that we were through the, the old uh, it's important, so well, let us just, uh, say a few words and for concluding the, this uh, first symposium that I remember we had a six symposium uh, uh, created by my colleague that I introduced before and uh, just to say that the groundbreakers think that someone that uh, changed in some way very deeply the discussion in the art world but the art uh, today, in this moment today is the fact that art is very in intervened with social issue, with economical issue, with change of lifestyle. It's very complex and it continues to uh, redefine the, uh, the, the idea of the of art that we, we have in the present time. Hopefully in this intervention at certain point, I don't want to speak anymore about merging because the situation has changed after 10 years, that is a show. And so, it's clearly the art following a kind of development is very plastic and fluid and interacting continuously with the context and the groundbreakers, they make groundbreaking shows, they are able at a certain point to change, to move these, uh, def these very complex definition of art in relationship to the, to the context, social, economical, etc. So I think this is very clear definition, very important to understand that understand the sense of, of this symposium. And uh, we have here three very important guests, uh, that uh, is Mr. Juan Rue, uh, Mr. Casper Koenig, and Mr. Hoffman Weser, but uh, there will be a publication at the end of this, and there will be other groundbreakers invited to contribute, because it was not impossible to invite everybody here. And that's the only publication at the end, which at least I hope there will be at least 12 contribution. And so I invite everybody who have even a chance to see this book because I think it will be something very important in the art, intervention art debate and even for the connection with the, 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 the celebration of the 20th anniversary of Foundation of Quantum Biennale as the third most important biennale in Asia in Anam. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for your participation. And I invite you to go to your meeting. Do not exist somewhere in a out there in the arts. A museum and an exhibition have a very, very strong interrelationship. And I think what is necessary in the future are more good museums, not bigger ones, better ones. So I'm
I'm very happy that I had really the privilege to work in a museum for 12 years. I have not been socialized in a museum. And I have a very strong, hate, love relationship to the place where I work in the city. And I will always look at things the way I visited. Every day, I would do a lot of boring things we all have to do. But I did it for the benefit of being every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gaspar. That's a lovely, lovely.